God's people said amen, amen and amen. Let's stand over the audience. We're going to sing page number one in the hymnal and on the screens as our choir continues to bless us and go down in just a moment. But we're thankful you're here. Look around. This is a good crowd for a frosty Sunday. Amen. Welcome to Calvary. We're glad you're with us today. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like clouds before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Mortals join the mighty chorus, which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us, Brother, love binds man to man. Giver singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. Good singing remains standing as our good pastor emeritus comes and opens in prayer. Our gracious God, this morning, we come to you with victory in our soul because of the abounding work of your amazing grace. It's a wonderful thing to know Christ, to have our sins pardoned, whereby we can sing victory in Jesus, our blessed Savior forever. And as we've gathered in your name to adore you, we lift up on high the most high God Amen. and your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that the mighty moving of the Holy Spirit will sweep over this place today and give us a great day, your day of singing, preaching, and praising God. We trust thee for the results to your glory. I pray that those that are here that are seeking will allow the Lord to meet their needs. May it be a great day in the Lord for the life of the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Continue to stand. This is what we call our fellowship song. If you're viewing over the live stream, let us know that you're out there tuned in. And to give us a good thumbs up, especially if you're here in the audience, we have visitors with us. Uh, make sure you go up and greet those individuals in the Lord. Welcome them here to the family at Calvary. We're going to sing our next song, The Way of the Cross Leads Home, on the second verse. Turn around, be friendly to the audience. Also, we have our, our tithes and offerings. Uh, make sure you get those turned in and keep the lights on. Try to keep the heat on. Amen. That's what we're trying. So, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I meet. Let me hear you, church. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Turn around, smile, greet our visitors.
Let's sing the second. I must needs go home in the blood-sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home, the way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world, to walk in it nevermore. For my Lord says, come, and I seek my home, where he waits at the open door. Sing it out, church. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. Home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Pastor Cup. Thank you. Be seated. Eddie had to look back to make sure I was there. He, he saw me leave the building for just a moment, but don't worry, because right before I left, I leaned over and I said, Pete, I'm leaving. You're preaching this morning. Well, we're so glad you're here this morning, as uh, Brother Eddie has already said, on a little bit colder than normal day, and uh, I'm just glad it feels like this right now in here. We, uh, we literally had the heaters on all night. We had a funeral here yesterday, and when it was over, we just left the heat on, and so all I'm saying to you, this is as hot as it's ever going to get when the temperature is 18 degrees at night. So hopefully we'll be having some warmer warmer days coming up. And I was telling somebody, maybe this is the last cold spell. And I said, no, we live in Texas. We'll have another one in like June or something like that. But, uh, but we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming. We do have a lot of announcements this morning. Best thing I can tell you to do is pick up a bulletin. So many things in here. Let me just go through some uh, very close upcoming things. We have outreach this Tuesday. Listen, outreach is the highlight of the month. Because we are going out and uh, uh, telling folks about the Lord, trying to get them into our church. And, and so we hope you'll be here 10 o'clock in the morning, and it will also be in the evening. 6 o'clock, we have a meal. 7 o'clock, of course, we go out. And then this Friday is a teen friendship banquet and the ABC Valentine party. That's going to be this Friday. Saturday is, and I don't even know about this, but the Grace Class Karaoke Party. That scares me right there, okay? Yeah. That frightens me. I'm just wondering, where'd you, where'd you go, Brother Eddie? Did I lose you? Oh, did he? Oh, okay. I was just wondering, like, were you going to sing I Got You, Babe, with somebody on that? Like Sonny and Cher, you know? Dolores is going to be singing. Okay. <laughs> we, we are in trouble. Uh, but I was, when I said that, I looked at the kids, and they were like, who? <laughs> Don't worry about it. We don't know any of your uh, of the singers today either. So, But uh, that's going to be this Saturday. Also this Saturday is the youth rally. I know you're looking at that. It's like, wow, teen stuff back to back. But the youth rally was supposed to be yesterday and uh, got postponed until this Sunday. So, And then next Sunday's Heart Sunday. We're going to celebrate by giving all of you ladies a special gift. And, uh, and then we've got Golden Agers Tuesday a week. We've got Wings. To, uh, Thursday a week, so again, lots of things coming up here, and, and if you notice, we even have some things a little bit further down the line that we're already putting into the bulletin, so that you will uh, uh, make sure and, and, and pay attention. The student ministries auction, again, will be the 23rd. We could use, again, your gently used or brand new items. And I know I've told you this story before. It's, it's always one of my favorite stories, and I will never have the courage to do this. But I know a pastor in Florida, and a lady brought a band, brand new vacuum cleaner for her home, and he brought him the old one. He said, I just brought a brand new vacuum cleaner, and I want to don donate the old one to the church. And he looked at her dead serious and said, no, we want the new one. And she was just like, uh, uh, uh. Uh, now, he, he did take that one, but he was actually making a good point. You know what the point is? <laughs> How often we give our leftovers to God. Here you go, God. This old vacuum cleaner, we've used it for 40 years. 
now you can use it there. But anyway, uh, if you have items, we would love to have them. Again, new or very gently used, you can drop them off at the Welcome Center. And again, let me just encourage you, look over the whole, whole bulletin here. We do have a few names that we have added for this week. Uh, we want you to remember Burgess Duckworth, a cousin-in-law of Nancy Simpson. He passed away yesterday of pancreatic cancer. And please just continue to pray for Miss Tina. Her brother, Timothy Davis, passed away on the 4th. And it's just going to be a private ceremony with the family. So please remember that family. A couple other names I wanted to add. Delbert Porninger, Donald's cousin, uh, excuse me, Donald's uncle. And uh, they have found a fast-growing tumor. He has 6 to 12 months to live. Um, and then Susan Harwood, Lori Haney's sister, will be having cancer surgery tomorrow. So please keep up with those uh, and our prayer needs. And, of course, when we have a, uh, something very urgent, we do post it on our uh, private Facebook page. And I want to say something about that page very quickly here. We do have two pages, a public and a private, and the private is for our church. And I say that because sometimes people want, will want, you know, someone that they'll request that somebody join. And I usually turn down every request to join unless they're a member of Calvary, because that's our private page. Now, our public page, anybody can get on it anytime. Uh, but our private page is reserved just for us because there, there are things on there that we don't necessarily, uh, that we're not necessarily going to broadcast for everyone. So uh, if you do send me a, a request, I will look it over. Uh, but generally, unless they're a church member or someone really, really close or involved with the church in some way, uh, we reject that. Well, I just want to read a few verses this morning for our scripture reading. And, our, and this is where we're going to be for the message in Mark 11. And our message is going to be mountain-moving faith. In, in Mark 11, verse 22, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. May God bless the reading from his word this morning. Also, I have one other announcement. Uh, this family does not know I was going to do this today, but I, I had them on my heart, and uh, it's Eddie and Betty Craddock. They're over here today. If you've been keeping up with Facebook, you know that uh, Brother Craddock's gone through quite a few procedures on his heart, and uh, he's not been able to work, and uh, I've already uh, made a donation to him this morning. He's wearing his overalls, which has about 62 pockets on it, so, so uh, there's 62, 62 ways to give an offering to Brother Eddie Craddock, amen? So I just went up to him personally and said, you take this, I wanted to help and bless your family. But if you'd like to do so through the church, please take an envelope and uh, write the Craddock family on it. They need some help right now. And uh, our church is a good church, and I know that we'll help them. Uh, we've helped other families uh, anonymously, but uh, uh, the Craddocks are a special family. Uh, Brother Eddie Craddock cooked the breakfast along with him and Brother Luce uh, uh, for years over in the Home Builders building for our men's prayer breakfast. And uh, we miss you, Brother Eddie, because Brother Luce burns the bacon. Amen? <laughs> All right. But uh, no, Brother Luce, you do a great job. But uh, we want to remember them even after church today. If you'd like to go by and visit with the Craddocks and slip something in his pocket, I know that would be a blessing. Otherwise, take an envelope and write Craddock family on it. Everything that comes in will go to them. Our church is going to be helping them also. But let's be a blessing to them. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Let's stand over the audience. Let's sing a shelter in the time of storm. And we've had a few of those ice storms recently. So let's have a shelter built and keep us warm. Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure 
whatever ill be tied, shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, shelter in the time of storm. Sing it out. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Y'all are singing great today. We're going to sing a chorus that's not usually in our hymns, but it's there on your screen. My faith still holds. Dolores and I have practiced this, but that means nothing. Amen. So y'all sing loud. My faith still holds. Can we get can we get that one started? D and the girls. I think I know it. My faith still holds on to the Christ of Calvary. Oh, blessed rock of ages cleft for Let's try it again, Brother Eddie. My faith still holds on to the Christ of Calvary. Oh, blessed rock of ages left for me. I'll gladly place my trust in things I can. sit down, say amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to ask our quartet to come up. I was making this introduction in the 830 service. Folks, I don't know about you, but we've had a hard two years. Amen. I've lost friends and loved ones, and uh, it seems like there's always something on the agenda. You've heard the prayer list, and if you're not a believer today, it's very easy to get discouraged. Amen. And so this song is dedicated to all those that are going through trials. Uh, we dedicate it to Brother Eddie Craddock over here and others. Uh, but one day we're going to be in an environment, we're going to be in a place where the worries and the, the anxiety will never reach us again. Amen? And that's called heaven. And we're going to sing about that in just a moment. This is entitled, I Won't Have to Worry Anymore. And if you have a worry, you listen to the lyrics of this song. Down here, my burdens are heavy, and the road seems rough and long. And sometimes my feet get weary, I'm so slow and so slow. But a brighter day is coming when I step on heaven's shore, and I won't have to worry anymore. Life 
is over and I've said my last goodbye. I'll see the Savior standing at the door. At the door. I'll hear him say, you're welcome. And all your cares are left behind. And I won't have to worry anymore. tenor in that group is David Phelps, um, or Daniel Phelps, or whatever it is, but uh, thank you, men, that sounded wonderful, and uh, if you would please turn to uh, Mark chapter 11, and we're going to look at mountain moving faith and what that means. I know we've heard that phrase all of our lives, and... Um, Sometimes we've heard it taken completely out of context and somebody will say, uh, here's your mountain moving faith, send my ministry a thousand dollars and I will send you a prayer cloth that I have prayed over. Now I do want to tell you this, you're welcome to send Calvary a thousand dollars but we're not sending you a prayer cloth, okay? Uh, I don't have any magical things, I don't have any special water that I can drop on you. But there's something that we can all have, and that is faith in God. And we're going to see what happens when we do have faith in God. Now, last week we finished with the cleansing of the temple, and it really wasn't the whole temple, um, but it was part, part of the temple that we know Jesus uh, kicked out some people, the money changers, some people who were selling animals, basically people who were ripping off what we would call the common people. And Jesus said, no, 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 my, my house is a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And then they passed the fig tree the next day, and it's dead. And Peter says, look, just what you said. And you know, I will just say this. I wonder if Peter asked that in an amazed way or a matter-of-fact way. Because Jesus said... You're not going to grow anymore. You're gone, fig tree. And I hope that Peter didn't say, wow, it's just what you said. Because, folks, of course it's what Jesus said. Of course it is. I hope he said it, just what you said, master. The fig tree's dead. And Jesus comes in, concludes this section on the fig tree and Judaism with four simple words in verse 22. Have Faith in God. Folks, that's where our faith belongs. And you realize all the different places where we put our faith. We put our faith in political figures or political parties. We put our faith in sports teams. We put our faith in our people around us. And in a sense, there's nothing wrong with putting your faith in other people. But understand that the ultimate faith that we have must be in God. There is no other place for our faith to be. And so he just simply starts out by saying, have faith in God. Let's pray together. 
Father, we're glad to be here this morning. We're thankful for this crowd today. And we know how easy it would have been to stay at home. And we've had this bad weather. And yet, Lord, this group has come out today. And I ask your blessings on them. And Lord, those that were not able to be here, whether it is the bad weather or they're sick or, or whatever the case may be, bless them as they watch over the uh, internet. And I pray, Lord, that when this message is over, we would indeed have mountain-moving faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted you to look first at the charge. Jesus gives one simple charge to them, and it's this. Have faith in God. And can I just tell you, no matter what is going on in your life, those four words are the answer to everything. You say, well, I'm struggling right now financially. Have faith in God. Man, I've got this, this boss at work who's just a jerk. Careful, Matthew. All right. Um, <laughs> let me tell you what to do. Have faith in God. You say, man, this family situation of mine is falling apart. Have faith in God. Folks, that's what we have to do. We have to believe and trust in God. And I want to remind you of the definition of faith that that I found about a year and a half ago, and I probably put it on the screen so many times, you're tired of it, but I love it. Faith is not belief without proof. It is trust without reservation. I get so tired again of people saying, oh, you Christian, you just believe, but you don't need any proof. I want to say, folks, that's not what faith is. Faith is saying, God, I'm going to trust you no matter what. I'm going to trust you without reservation. I'm going to trust you with my body, my soul, and my spirit. And I've heard it said many times how insane we are that we will trust God with our eternal souls at the moment of salvation, but we won't trust God to get us through next week. Folks, we're His for eternity. And I know this, no matter what comes my way the next week or month or year, I know where I'm going to be 100 years from now. And I'm going to be in eternity with God, and I'm not going to give a care about anything because I'm going to be with the Lord. That's why our faith must be, again, trust without reservation. And folks, we have to have faith because Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And I've said this so many times, I'm going to say it to my dying day. It does not say that without faith it is difficult to please Him. It does not say without faith it is improbable to please him. It says without faith I cannot possibly please him no matter what I do if I don't have faith. And I want to tell you this, the, the biggest way that you can measure your Christian life is to measure your faith. Now you might say, wait a minute, doesn't it say love is the greatest of these? Love is the greatest of these. But do you understand that one day... As it says, and it is well with my soul, my faith shall be sight. One day I'm not going to need faith. And as it says in Sweet Beulah Land, it says the same thing. I'm looking now just across the river to where my faith will end in sight. One day I'm not going to need faith anymore. I'm not going to need hope anymore one day. You know why? Because all of my hopes will be in Jesus Christ and I will be with him for eternity. But you know what? Love will last forever. Love will last forever. But right now in your Christian life, measure your faith. Am I truly, truly trusting God? And I, and I know I've said this before with verse 6 when it says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And I, when I was a kid, I'd read that and I would go, That he is what? And I couldn't get that. Because I've been taught in school, you have to have a noun and a verb. And I know they're all... They've all changed all the terminology. It's predicates, and I don't know. There's some of you out there going, Brother Monk, you're missing everything with that. Okay, well, just when I was a kid, it was a noun and a verb, all right? Subject and predicate. and Anyway, all I know is I would read that verse as a kid and go, that sentence is not complete. Must believe that he is. Until one day I went, oh, I have to believe that he is. <laughs> By the way, he is his third person. You know what first person of he is? Is? I am. You know what you have to do? 
You have to have faith that God is the I am. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I love that last part. Listen, if you're serious about seeking God, you will find him. And he promises that in the Old Testament. If with all your heart you truly seek me, you shall ever surely find me, thus saith the Lord. And I want to tell you this. This charge is simply this. We have to have faith in God. We cannot live our life without it. Now here's the challenge. Look at verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Wow. That's a big promise, isn't it? And he talks here about what we call mountain-moving faith. You can even say, mountain be cast into the sea. Now I want to tell you what I think Jesus was referring to right now. Herod the Great, who was dead at this time, he built a fortress about seven and a half miles south of Jerusalem. And as it says on the screen, Herod had literally removed an adjacent hill, the base of which is still visible today, in order to surround the citadel of Herodian with a rounded earthwork. Now, we're not going to see them yet, but I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of this place called Herodian. And by the way, this is where Herod the Great is buried. And it's about seven and a half miles south, south, southwest of Jerusalem. And what he did, he wanted to build this this big safety place, this, this big fortress, and notice that the sides of it are curved. Because what he did, he went next door, cut down a mountain, and then formed it so that it would be very, very difficult for an opposing army to get to the top. And when you're on the Mount of Olives, you can see this from the Mount of Olives. And so they had literally seen someone move a mountain. And this is it from the side. You see how steep it is. And by filling in all of the crags and only allowing one way to the top, Herod had a place to run to if an opposing army came against him. So that's, I believe, one of the things that Jesus was referring to when he said, you want to move a mountain? Now again, this is not in Scripture. Go about seven and a half miles from here. And you'll see somebody who moved a mountain to build his own fortress. And that's the fortress. You can go to it today. And we have to remember, folks, that Jesus says here, if you have faith, this is what can happen in your life. But we also have to remember the commitment in verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So here's the challenge. Get out there and start praying with faith. What, what do I need to pray about? And I would just say, what has God laid on your heart? What has God laid on your heart? Who is it that we need to pray for? Again, I mentioned this earlier. Do you have a situation in your life that just it's just not working out? Start praying. <coughs> but remember, remember, got to be careful to take all of Scripture about prayer and mix it together. Because you could look at this verse and just say, oh great, all I have to do is believe and I'll get whatever I want. And we forget James 1, 6 and 7. Here's what it says. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Listen, if you're going to approach God and you approach him, well, you know, God, I kind of just, uh, you know, I just, uh, man, if you're going to pray, pray. We're told in Hebrews 4 to come boldly to the throne of grace. Quit going, well, I, I, I guess this is where I'm supposed to. Jesus said, get up here, get to my throne. Get on your knees and start praying boldly. But if we walk in 
and we're mealy mouth and well I don't know look at this for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord you walk in going well I guess I should be praying I don't listen you're getting nothing <laughs> you're getting nothing you've got to go in with boldness you've got to pray and again I can't imagine there's not a that there's a single person here that doesn't have something that they really need to be praying about in their life right now. And if you're going to do it, do it. Again, another verse that we have to be cautious about in our prayer, 1 John 3, 22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Hey, if the verse stopped there, we would go, great, we're all done. But then it says, why do we receive it? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. I would say this, listen, make sure your life is aligned with God when you're praying, okay? You can't go out and sin Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then get on your knees Saturday and say, God, bless my life. No, God says this, listen, make sure your life is in tune with mine. Keep my commandments. Do those things that are pleasing to me. I want to say this real quick about pleasing God. We, we often hear this, and it is absolutely true. There's nothing you can do that can change God's love for you. Nothing. You could be on the lowest spot, pot, uh, the lowest spot in your life, God loves you. High spot in your life, God loves you. But I want to tell you this. This verse talks about pleasing God. Because, see, I could have God love me, but God not be pleased with me. And if you're wondering how that's possible, just have children. Because there are times you will love them with all your heart, but you will not be pleased with them. And I want to tell you this, and I mean this absolutely serious, what I'm about to say. I really don't feel I truly understood who God was until I had kids. And then I understood how you can love somebody with all your heart and want to strike them dead. I mean, I understood that. It, it made it, It's like... Man, this, is, this must be how God feels toward me. I mean, I know he loves me, but he's up there going, oh, oh, my goodness. Listen, God understands, and he doesn't just want us to be loved. He wants us to be pleasing. And we have to remember, listen, with any request we make, here's what Warren Wiersbe said. Jesus made this promise on the recognized premise that petitions must be in harmony with God's will. Okay, It has to be God's will. Folks, I say that because Brother Eddie mentioned a little bit earlier over these last two years how many folks he's known who have passed away. We've all known people who have passed. Did we pray for those people? Did we? And yet they still pass. And sometimes it's a hard thing to grasp, and I don't always get it, but I do know this. God always knows what's best. And that's easy to say right this moment. It's hard to say in the heat of the moment when difficulties and trials are upon you. But listen, God does know what's best. And whatever I pray, I must pray, Lord, is it your will? Let me give you one more quote from Warren Wiersbe. I found a couple of great ones from here. God is always ready to respond to obedient believers' prayers, and they can petition him knowing that no situation or difficulty is impossible for him. Folks, listen. What is impossible to God? And the answer is nothing. He can do as he pleases. Now, yes, he stays within his character, right? He's not going to sin. He stays within his character, but nothing's impossible to him. And very often we look at situations and we say, there's no way that this could work out. And I've, I've given you this illustration so many times, and one of these days I'm going to actually put it on the video, but uh, in the movie, uh, I can only imagine. When Bart Millard is, he's about to give his song, I can only imagine, to Amy Grant and let her sing it. And if you've seen the movie, you know the irony is, is she's up there about to sing it, and she just stops and says, this is not my song, this is yours, you take it. But she asked him, tell me the story behind the song. And he said, my dad was a monster growing up. And I saw 
God change him into the man I want to be. And then he said this, he said, I'd kind of forgotten that God does that. You know, we kind of forget that God does that, don't we? We forget that God can still do the impossible. And we get so caught up in in putting God in our little box and saying, well, we've got him figured out. Folks, you know who had God figured out? The Pharisees. They had God figured out. Oh, they knew exactly, and they and and they knew exactly where he was, and they had it, and God just says, Quit putting me in a box. You don't have me figured out. I've said this before, and I'm going to say this uh, to my dying day. If you think everything to know about God is in a book this thin, your God's too small. What there is to know about God, I believe we're going to be learning about him for all eternity. For all eternity. But here's what Jesus said in Mark 10, 27. And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Look at this. With us it's impossible. But I want you to listen or or look on the screen for the next verse because this, this phrase is a little bit different. This is also Jesus speaking. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And I looked up mustard seed in Scripture. Mustard seed is in the Bible five times. And there's also a word that is connected with mustard seed every time, and it's the word grain. Because Jesus is not saying here you have to have the faith of a mustard seed, which, by the way, was the smallest seed in that area. He said the grain of a mustard seed. Just just click off a little bit. That's all the faith that you have to have. Because I want to tell you, our faith is not nearly as important as the object of our faith. Our faith is in God. And if we put our faith anywhere else, what's the point? And hear what Jesus is saying. If you have faith just that much, and you remember those verses we read a moment ago, and you don't waver, and you keep your life in tune with God, these things aren't impossible anymore. And I want you to notice the very last phrase there. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Why? Because the verse before said this, with men it is impossible. And now Jesus says, oh, but listen, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing. And I just ask you again, what is it in your life that's impossible right now? By the way, do you realize that everything is impossible until somebody does it? Can you imagine going back to the 1600s and going, one day we're going to put a man on the moon. They'd be going, with a horse? I mean, how are we going to do this? Oh, I mean, what are you, we going to build something up there? I mean, the concept would have just blown them away. And yet, you know what? We've been on the moon. And there are so many things that, that people will tell you, it's impossible, you can't do that. And listen, if you have faith in the God of the possible... Things can change. And you might say again, what are you talking about? Whatever God is laid on, laying on your heart right this moment. I say again, some of you have family situations that are really rough right now. And you're saying, man, there's, it's just, there's no way this is going to work out. Well, are you going to pray wavering or unwavering? You say, but preacher, you don't know what I'm going through with, with this situation at work and and and." In this situation here, in this situation, I don't, but God does. God does. He knows what you're going through. And I ask you, will you fall on your knees with absolute faith in God and believe Him and trust in Him, or will you approach Him all mealy-mouthed and go, well, you know, I, I know you're kind of strong, God, and I guess you're able to do this, so, you know, I guess I ought to pray. Folks, go to him boldly. 
Now I'm going to end by reading a story to you. I have a book up here called 19 Gifts of the Spirit. And I'm not sure. I've, I've heard some say, oh, there's 26 gifts, so there's 22. Or it, 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 there's a lot of lists in the New Testament. I'm not sure how many gifts there are of the Spirit. But, but in the one called The Gift of Faith, I'm going to read you the first two paragraphs of this, of this book, of, of this chapter, The Gift of Faith. And remember, we're talking about mountain-moving faith. I have heard this story, by the way, uh, for many years, but I, I've never heard the details of it until I got this book. And I want you to listen to this. In 1973, a church on Route 46 in Netcong, New Jersey, faced an insurmountable problem. They had just built a new sanctuary on the recently acquired eight-acre property, half of which was mountain and woods. They were told they would not be granted permanent occupancy until they had sufficient parking in the rear. Now, I do want to tell you all this just to let you know. We have sufficient parking here. They've already checked that out, okay? The trouble was 40 feet of sheer mountain rose abruptly at the back of the church, leaving insufficient space for the legally required parking lot. Can you imagine, folks? Building a church building, we're all excited, and then the city comes out and says, you don't have enough parking. You can't occupy the building. And you look up, and there's no place to put parking because you built this on the side of a mountain. One Sunday morning, Pastor Ray Crawford reminded the congregation of Christ's promise. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it will remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Then he added, If you believe that, come on Wednesday night to pray with me that God will move this mountain from the back of our church. Now we talk about mountain moving faith. These people literally needed mountain moving faith. The next morning, the phone rang. It was the telephone company. They were planning to erect a new building and needed fill for a large swampy site. They had learned that the mountain back of the church had the correct proportions of sand, clay, and rock for the required fill. Within a month, the phone company hauled away 40,000 square yards of field for which they paid the church $5,400. Not only removing the mountains, but leveling the ground for the required three parking lots and preparing them for paving. That is one of the most phenomenal stories I have ever read in my life. And I'm serious, I'm, I've got goosebumps right now when I read that. They literally had to have mountain moving faith and the very next day they got a call and said, we need to remove your mountain. Is that okay with you? And would you mind if we paid you? <laughs> Phenomenal. And listen, I've known many people who have had to have faith like that. A good pastor friend started pastoring a church, and he wasn't told everything about the church before he got there. And he found out, Monday morning after he preached his first sermon that there was a bond program nobody had told him about. Here's how he found out. Somebody walked into his office Monday morning and said, I'm ready to cash in. I need $10,000. He said they had $541 in the bank. And he just prayed and prayed and prayed. And he just said, we don't have it. And the person said, I'm going to be back next Monday. If you don't have it, we're going to go to court. And he just fell flat on his face and just cried out to God and cried out to God. He, he mentioned it next, the, the, the next Sunday in church. and said, folks, we need this tomorrow. They took up an offering, and it wasn't even closed. So he's in his office Monday morning ready to face whatever consequences there were. And he gets a knock on the door and he says, here it goes. But it wasn't the man who wanted to cash in his bonds. 
it was a lady that walked in and said, I know you don't even know me, but I went to this church many years ago, and God just laid it on my heart to give you an offering, and she handed him a $10,000 check. And folks, I've heard stories like that all my life, and I want to tell you this, uh, and please don't, don't think I'm just applying all this to money. I'm not. But I'm saying this, God can move a mountain for you. What we need is our little tiny grain of mustard seed faith. That's it. Again, it's not that God wants us to have a barrel full of faith. He just asks for a little faith in the right person. And we're so concerned, well, I just don't have enough faith. I don't have, I don't care. All God asks is that much from you. That's what he asks. What you need to be concerned with is my faith in the right person. And if your faith is in Jesus Christ, that will change everything. And everything can change too. Here are our salvation facts we mention every week. Folks, everything can change if you recognize who you are. You're a sinner. I know people don't like to hear that, but we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. And God wants you to be saved. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead, and now you can be forgiven. All you have to do is trust him. Put your faith in him. I don't have a lot. Do you have a grain of a mustard seed? That's enough. Trust Jesus Christ to save your soul, and he'll do that today. Receive him. Pray. Ask God to save you right now. We talked about prayer earlier. The greatest prayer you can pray is, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to save my soul. That's the best prayer you can pray, and God will save you right now if you'll do that. But Christian, I again want to ask you, how's your faith? But far more important, how's the object of your faith? Because here's what Jesus said, have faith in God. Let's stand together. Father, right now I ask you to bless this invitation time. If there's someone here that, that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that even now they're praying and asking you to save them. If there, there are Christians here who are struggling with their faith, Lord, help them to realize it's not that they need a great deal of faith, it's who their faith is in. And that all of us need to place our faith not just in you, Lord, but, but everything we have. We need to understand it comes from you, it's yours, and you are ours, and we have all that we need through Jesus Christ. And right now during this invitation, we pray for lives to be touched and changed. We pray for souls to be saved. We pray for a difference to be made in all of our lives as we place our faith in you. Bless this invitation time in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, in just a moment, Brother Eddie's going to be singing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Listen, if you've never been saved, come down and pray here. Brother Donnie's sitting right here. If you're if you need a little bit more instruction or you just want somebody to pray with you, he'd be glad to pray with you. And there, there are men and women all over this building that'd be glad to pray with you if, if you want somebody to pray with you. And Christian, again, how is your faith? Is it strong? Is it in the Lord? Is it wavering? Well, listen, don't let it waver. Trust in God. Have faith in God. And make it write what this song says I have decided to follow Jesus sing for us brother Eddie I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. 
no turning back. I'm going to have just the instrumentalist play on this next verse. Just the instrumentalist. Continue to just be in a spirit of prayer as God is working down here at these altars. Still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. Let's, let's, let's sing together no on that last verse. Let's sing it really loud here. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Listen, decide to follow Jesus, do it without wavering. Get in behind him, follow him wherever he may lead. Tonight, I just wanted to mention to you, uh, Brother Payne is going to be speaking tonight, Brother Donnie the next Sunday night, Brother Eddie the next Sunday night, and by then we will be finished with our uh, discipleship, and, and then we'll all be back over here, and, and uh, sometime later this year we will do a second round of this discipleship, and this time uh, we're going to ask people to sign up, and, and we'll probably have uh, five or six different groups. And uh, we're excited about that. We want, we want everybody to grow. We want people to grow in the Lord. But we also want to grow in our love and our friendship for one another. And I hope we will do that. Again, thank you for being here tonight at 6 o'clock. I hope we'll be here as Brother Payne preaches. And we're going to go ahead and close in prayer. Brother Corey, would you pray for us, please?